All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, last week, we were, of course, treated to a Democratic National Convention long on feel-good montages, Republicans frozen in time from 1996, and outrageously vapid symbolic gestures, but short on anything approaching a pro-working class agenda. Makes sense, given Biden's pledge that nothing will fundamentally change. Corporatist icon Larry Summers reported role in helping select Biden administration personnel. And top advisor Ted Kaufman's comments that they aren't planning to do much of anything once they get in charge because the pantry will be bare. Check out Sagar's Radar for more on the wonderful people being welcomed in the Democratic Party 10. <laughs> but while anyone paying attention would note that the modern Democratic Party is working overtime to please the donor class right down to selecting their vice presidential candidate of choice, all of their efforts are still not enough for one tech billionaire. Jim Clark, founder of Netscape, WebMD, and a few other very successful companies, is out with a big op-ed in the Washington Post, and every line is a real treat, folks. He begins with this philosophical musing. The life and death cycle of human existence applies equally to businesses. Older companies eventually die or fade away in a changing world, while new companies emerge to address and define new markets. Businesses are just like people. Possibly unintentional homage to this famous Mitt Romney moment. Cor corporations are people, my friend. But according to Jim, our friend the corporation is in dire peril under a Biden administration. Why? Well, here he is. The Democratic Party is proposing to make the tax rate on capital gains the same as that on ordinary income. <gasps> This increased tax on investment gains will kill the ability for startup companies to raise capital, and with fewer new businesses, the United States will fall behind. Why are Democrats forever forfeiting business support to the Republican Party? Let me stop you right there, Jim. First of all, it's adorable that you think Democrats are actually going to equalize the investment tax rates and the wage tax rates. What could possibly make you think that they would follow through on such a thing? They don't talk about it much. They don't care what the left of the party thinks, certainly. And the second they got serious about it, every one of your rich friends would be on the phone threatening to withhold their next campaign contribution. So don't worry, buddy. You're all good. But let's suspend reality for a moment and imagine that suddenly Joe really felt that FDR spirit and actually went for it. Do you really think that if the capital gains rate goes from 20 to 37 percent, rich people are just going to completely stop investing? I mean, really think about this. The guy who gave Google $100,000 at their start, an investment which is now worth over a billion dollars, do you think he would have sat on his hands if he knew the tax on that insane windfall would be a little bit higher? The level of greed reflected in this op-ed is just so obscene. So let me get this straight. Not only do you get a zillion loopholes that probably make your effective tax rate lower than the average worker watching this show, not only are many of these tech companies launched with technology invented by government-funded research, but you also want to make sure that you're getting a better deal on your play money than people who actually work for a living. But there's so much more here from Mr. Clark. Seemingly aware that his argument might be viewed as a little elitist, he tries to make a pitch that this whole special treatment of capital gains thing was really a populist pitch aimed at the American worker. I'm not kidding. He writes, unlike in the days of Henry Ford, modern startups award stock to their employees, treating them as co-owners of the business and spreading the corporate wealth. If they get a stock award and hold it for a suitable period, why should they have to pay ordinary income taxes on it? They are just investors of a different type. Now, there is a difference from the Henry Ford model, but it is the exact opposite of what this guy is arguing. Ford understood that his workers needed to be able to afford to buy his cars, so he actually paid a decent wage. Now, he was also a union-busting anti-Semitic jerk by all accounts, so let's not go too far with the nostalgia. But the idea that workers today have it better and have been cut in on the corporate money-making deal is absolutely laughable. Here's some numbers. In 2019, only 6% of households in the bottom 80% of income earners had any capital gains at all. At the other end of the spectrum, three quarters of all capital gains accrue to the top 1% of income earners. Mr. Clark concludes with this gem, quote, the main thing here is making businesses succeed. They are the economy. Government should support them. Now, if you're talking about small business, like the 40% who are in danger of permanently closing right now today, you're right. Government should support them right now. But keeping the capital gains tax low isn't going to do a damn thing for them. But you're not really talking about them, are you? 
You're talking about keeping the taxpayer-funded goodie, which is a massive subsidy to you and your rich friends. Just one more billionaire who believes their wealth entitles them to dictate everything, from tax policy to which companies get a shot to which deserving causes get funded. And I got news for you, Jim. You can rest easy, because in a Trump or a Biden administration, you will continue to be able to do exactly that. <laughs> and Sagar, it gave me flashbacks uh. to that moment when, you know, obviously in the Obama era, like they bailed out the banks, no one went to prison, people were paying themselves on Wall Street big right. bonuses after destroying the, the economy. But he incorporated a little bit of populist language into his rhetoric and like Wall Street melted down. Yeah. They couldn't take it. Oh, my God. How could he say this about them? This whole op-ed and the like delusional departure from reality and what a Biden administration would actually look like reminded me of that. Oh, of course. And look, even if they do touch capital gains, what's it going to go up by like 2 percent max? And they're going to be like, wow, we dramatically changed the markets. Uh, no, the capital gains thing is a total canard. I cannot believe that even Trump and all these other people are talking about it. So far, that's the only thing, one of the only things he said he's going to do in his second term. So great. The capital gains. Uh, tax along rate. with the payroll tax cool. code, which is actually one of the best taxes that we have in our society. I'm like, cool. Okay. That's, you know, real, real great message that you have there. But you're right. It is laughable to think that these people do not have support in both parties. It's really about which sector of business which is most represented in mm -hmm. either party. Yeah. Fossil fuels and a few others in one, Hollywood in the other. Wall Street has both. Yes. So it's like, okay, um, how are they not? Oh, and Silicon Valley has the left as well. So, so you basically have like venture capital in Hollywood. It's almost like East versus West Coast plus the South. And the South is with the right, and then the East Coast generally owns both with the establishments. That's a terrible situation that we live in right now. It's ludicrous to think that those people aren't dramatically powerful in both parties. And I think it's interesting. It's actually really interesting to get into these people's mentality because he really believes this. Yeah, like, they're he very feels, entitled. Yeah. He feels that his view is not represented anywhere. Yes. He feels like a man without a party. And in the, the reality is the exact opposite. You know, people like you own both of these parties. Yeah. Like You can pick up the phone, and either one of these parties will take your phone calls and so that level of like disconnected delusion and also weird like victim mentality is one thing and then the other thing that's important is again that when you understand this mentality you start to understand why politicians act and behave as they do because these are the type of people that are in their ears all day they're the people who get washington post op ads when you're make exactly right when when you're making fundraising calls all day long you will hear this ideology on the other end of the line all day long and human be beings being what they are first of all they want to please you so they can get that next campaign right. contribution or so that they can have that next gig lined up for them when they get out of office but you're very influenced by that ideology which is spouted around you all day long. So that's why when I see things like this, you have to take note because this is the way that a lot of the people who are unbelievably influential in this town and across the country, this is the way that they I talk with some of them and it, it's always amazing the way that they come across with that victimhood mentality. They truly believe that any discussion, discussion of, hey, you know, maybe that capital gains tax should go up, or any discussion whatsoever about restructuring, reordering society, their, you know, sensors go off. They're like, whoa. This is a <gasps> Class huge warfare. Exactly. Oh my God. Exactly. Class warfare. What are you doing? <laughs> you're coming after me. You brain populist. You're mean. You know, you're, you know, I mean, they, they can't take it. They truly cannot. I mean, you could go back whenever I got into that fight with the billionaire Clifford Asinus. It was the same thing. Yeah. Because it's like, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, reforming Wall Street. And they, these people lose their minds at the idea that they are not the, like, paragons of our society and they've created so many hundreds of millions of new jobs. And I, I try to distinguish between like, you know, somebody who's an industrialist and somebody who just moves money around and, and speculates and then grifts through the legal system, which yeah. they created and have donated to in order to make money, otherwise known as private equity in the hedge fund business. Right. And, Cl yeah. and look, Clark has created real companies. Yeah, like he, sure. he really has, you know, he built that whatever, right? right? With a lot of, That's I'm sure, help along the way. Very great. Congratulations. Yeah. But the status quo is a class war on the working class mm -hmm. and lower income people. Like, so if if you're a Jim Clark, you don't have to talk about that waging that war. Just protecting right. the status quo is class warfare because they've got the system rigged in that way. They're the ones who get their phone calls answered, all of those things. And so the minute, like if you think even just about the capital gains rate, 
and the ordinary income rate. That current structure is class war. It is deeply unfair to wage earners. But when you think about changing that structure at all, they completely melt down. And that's when they cry like class war and you hate business and how come neither party like really represents me. So um, anyway, yeah. very interesting digging into his thoughts this morning. <laughs> and coming up on Rising, Marshall Kosloff is going to share his thoughts on Tim Scott's speech at the RNC. That one, Rising Returns. <laughs> 